We're going to get into our last speaker here, Jared. Uh, Jared is here on behalf of Hooch. Um, Hooch is basically a mobile app that incentivizes you with a free drink every day at a different bar. Um, so I think he's going to give us a little bit of background about the yeah, app. Awesome, right? I think he's going to give us a little bit of background about that. But uh, he's going to talk about a subject that I think a lot of us are hearing a lot about lately, but really don't know what the hell it is, uh, and that's blockchain technology. So. Without further ado, uh, let's introduce a warm welcome for J uh, Jared here. Good first slide, right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about some really speculative, cutting edge technology and the way in which it's already impacting the world of marketing and digital advertising. That's right, it's blockchain, a tech that's a little bit of a pain in the ass to understand, but with incredibly useful applications across a wide variety of industries. Some people say that the development of blockchain is as important as the development of the internet. This tech guru, Don Tapscott, says blockchain represents the next major digital revolution, that it can help reshape the world of business and transform the old order of human affairs for the better. So we're not going to talk about transforming the order of human affairs because that's pretty intense, but we do get to talk about blockchain and advertising today. A little bit about me, I've been in ad tech since early high school back down in Alabama. A couple of my classmates and I put together a company that actually did pretty well back in the wild west days of the internet. Uh, after we all went off to college, we decided to get back together and do the same thing again. So we formed a company called Yellowhammer, which is named after the state bird of Alabama. Uh, we actually built a lot of pretty cutting edge ad tech, at least back at that time. Uh, we ended up growing our company towards about 100 million in annual revenue. We had about 100 employees. Our clients include a lot of the hot digital and e-commerce brands like Warby Parker, Casper, Living Social, Rent the Runway, Postmates. And my new company, which is a little different, is called Hooch, which is the first subscription drink and hospitality app. Our members pay us $10 a month and get a free drink every day at over 500 bars and restaurants across 10 cities. It's very different than my old ad tech days. <laughs> so there's no restrictions on where you can go or how many times you go back to the same bar or restaurant. Uh, the only catch is that you can't use it more than once a day. So it basically incentivizes you to choose a place and then stay there based on getting your first drink free. We also launched a higher membership tier. We have some major hotel investors in deals. Uh, we get access to unpublished rates that aren't allowed to be accessible from a search engine, uh, but we can show them because we're technically uh, behind a paywall or a membership organization. Uh, we end up offering 65% off Expedia hotel rates sometimes. We need hotel tonight, uh, just so hotels can get rid of unsold inventory. We have concierge services and we have uh, money can't buy experiences. We do celebrity events, fashion week tickets, Coachella backstage, things like that. But the real business model isn't our subscription revenue, it's the data. For example, the alcohol industry is massive, but relatively low tech. Other than reports on how many cases a product are sold by a venue, brands just really don't have reliable data on who's consuming what. They know that the vodka is out, but was it college kids buying shots or, or people getting cocktails? Hundreds of millions are spent every year by brands doing these spray and pray campaigns or hiring survey companies to figure out the demographics behind who's buying which brand. They're literally getting these twice a year reports from Nielsen or whoever, somebody with an iPad going into a venue and asking questions like, 
To the best of your memory, did more men or women order a Patron brand tequila and about how old would you say they were? Like this is literally where the industry is at. Meanwhile, when someone redeems a drink on Hooch, we know obviously real time that ex-consumer, 32 years old, uh, your female ordered a Belvedere martini and you gave it a good rating. So coming from the ad tech industry, it was really kind of surprising for me because I've always just kind of taken real time data for granted. Uh, to go into sort of like an old school industry like that. So, quick data story. Becky Yellowhammer, Living Social, was uh, one of our earliest clients. Uh, I remember sort of that client driving our transition into more data-driven advertising back about a decade ago. Living Social had an insatiable desire for signups. Uh, if we could drive an email signup to their site, they pay something like $6 CPA per person who put in their email and became a living social member. At the time, we really didn't have that much money in the bank, and yet we decided that our smartest move is to bet it all on a single day of ad spend. So we buy out this day, the 300 by 250 on the top right of msn.com for 24 hours. I don't know what that space costs now, but Back in the day, it was $300,000 to own that for 24 hours, which is crazy. Ton of traffic, default homepage on Internet Explorer. So we gambled all our money on the math that the $6 living social CPA times X number of signups would add up to more than our $300,000 spend. And how did it go? We turned on the ad and we prayed and we crashed the living social site. <laughs> I can't, this is the actual screenshot I dug out of my email from a few years ago. <laughs> We're sending them so many new customers that their servers couldn't keep up with the traffic. But despite that and their site going down, we still ended up signing up over 100,000 people in one day to Living Social, coming out to about 600,000 revenue and 300 of that as profit. So we're on to something now. <laughs> we have a business. And we keep doing it, but each time we buy out that 300 by 250, we end up signing up less and less people. Our profit margin's dropping, so we need to innovate. We end up developing our own in-house dynamic creative optimization system where people in Seattle would see an image of sushi and people in Texas would get a hamburger. Uh, in the morning, you're getting a breakfast sandwich. At night, you're getting one of these cupcakes, which were all over the internet for a while. So, we get better and better at targeting and optimization, but the battle to keep our margins got harder and harder, and I think this was really reflective of the industry at the time. As ad tech companies continue to compete and innovate, simple tactics that worked and made money in the past weren't so effective anymore. You had to be better, faster, and more efficient. Big data became the norm, and suddenly you have a team of data scientists running complex reporting and looking for patterns just to stay competitive. Real-time bidding and ad exchanges starts to mirror more financial marketplaces, and now we have artificial intelligence systems, chatbots, contextual and sentiment analysis to measure the success of campaigns. It's like a digital arms race of who's got the best data and who can use it most intelligently. While we've seen a steady push of innovation in the industry over the years, I believe that blockchain technology has the potential to be a sudden leap forward in how we think about advertising. So, I know this is this is a weighty topic. <laughs> to understand blockchain, let's uh, let's first take a look at Bitcoin. And I've got an exciting video clip that's going to do some of my work for me. Let's see if this works. Tonight we're going to talk about cryptocurrencies. Everything you don't understand about money combined with everything you don't understand about computers. <laughs> the main currency you've probably heard about is Bitcoin. It's been all over the news because last year its value exploded from around $1,000 at the beginning of the year to $9,000 by November to nearly $20,000 by December. Bitcoin became such a hot topic that paparazzi started asking celebrities about it. Watch Michael Keaton leaving a restaurant. See you guys. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, would you recommend buying Bitcoin? Dude, you know what's funny? I was just talking to my buddy about that who knows about this. I got, I got two different... One guy said, yeah, you probably want to, and another friend of mine said, uh, not like it's a bad thing, they just don't know where it's going to go. I've got to say, you do not expect conversating with paparazzi to be so nuanced. This was a dramatic shift. 
Because just a few years ago, you'd only hear about Bitcoin from that one guy in your office who wouldn't shut up about it. Let's call him Dan. And the reason that we're calling him Dan is that Dan is the exact guy in our office who's been annoying everybody with his, you've got to get into Bitcoin shit for years. This is why we hate Dan. It's obviously not the only reason, but it's the easiest one to bring up right now. The point is, lately, more and more normal people, or non-Dans, have been getting into cryptocurrency. So with all this excitement and curiosity, we thought we'd try and explain a few things tonight. Bitcoin, blockchain, the technology that allows it to exist, and cryptocurrencies in general. And I'm going to be simplifying things a lot here. So let's start with Bitcoin, which is a digital decentralized currency. That basically means Bitcoin only exists as computer code, and there is no bank or government creating or controlling it. And I know that this is already a little hard to understand, so I'll let this man in a Bitcoin suit give you a surprisingly decent explanation. I'm a virtual currency. <laughs> Worldwide, you can send for little to no fees. Open source, not controlled by any government, corporation, or individual. It's financial freedom, bro. <laughs> Thanks, bro. That is a nuanced and accurate explanation of a complex topic delivered with the help of a man in a stupid costume, and I would love to make fun of that, except it's literally the entire business model of this fucking television show. And look, you, you might at this point be thinking, but wait, how do you make money from Bitcoin? To which Dan would say, he just trade it on exchanges like any other currency. And if you then asked, well, how does it have value? Dan would reply, how does any money have value, man? And then he'd say, call me the brain for later, because I just blew your fucking mind. <laughs> to which you'd say, forget I asked, Dan, you're absolutely gross, I hate you. But the problem is, Dan is kind of right. Like most currencies, the fundamental reason that Bitcoin has value is because people agree that it has value. We're blockchain experts now, right? <laughs> Just out of curiosity, how many of you folks own any Bitcoin? What about any of the Ethereum or any of the other weird ones? <laughs> All right. So, for our purposes, the main points to take home are that Bitcoin is different than your standard fiat currencies, like dollars or euros, in, in several important ways. It's decentralized, which is probably the single most important characteristic. No single institution, such as a government or a bank, controls the Bitcoin network. The transactions are instead verified by a distributed and open network owned by no one. With fiat currencies, central banks can issue as much as they want and can attempt to manipulate a currency's value. With Bitcoin, the supply is automatically controlled by an algorithm, with a smaller and smaller amount of Bitcoin being released until it reaches a cap of 21 million total Bitcoin, which is expected to hit in about 100 years or so. Since there's no central validator or bank, users do not need to identify themselves when sending Bitcoin to another user. The system doesn't need to know your identity or even necessarily where the money is moving to. It's actually kind of funny if you're, uh, if you're transferring your money out of one of the big exchanges like Coinbase, uh, they have no clue where you're sending it. There's a pop-up that's like, for tax purposes, could you please honor system tell us, like, is this going to another exchange or Yes or no, like, they, please tell us the truth. They really can't see where it's going. So finally, the Bitcoin ledger is com considered immutable, meaning Bitcoin transactions cannot be reversed. If a transaction is recorded on the network, it's essentially impossible to modify. And well, fun fact, the first real world Bitcoin transaction, this guy used it to buy a pizza eight years ago. Bitcoin was pr considered pretty worthless back then, and he was probably kind of proud of himself that he duped somebody into giving him a pizza for nothing. Uh, so he spent 10,000 Bitcoin in exchange for a pizza, which is worth about three quarters of a billion dollars in today's <laughs> price, eight years later. So what makes all this possible? It's the underlying technology called blockchain. Take a look. Whether Bitcoin catches on or not, many people believe that the really exciting thing about it is the potential of the innovative technology that it's built on, and that's something called blockchain. Now, normally, if I wanted to send money to someone across the world, a bank would need to verify that transaction, and it could take days. But with Bitcoin, it is vastly faster because no bank is involved, and that is because blockchain technology allows a record or a ledger 
of every Bitcoin transaction ever made to be stored not in one place, but across vast numbers of computers. That is part of what people mean when they say Bitcoin is decentralized. And decentralization has a lot of theoretical advantages from speed to security. The key point here is that this is a distributed ledger. There is no central server. All the other ledgers that we have, all banking ledgers, all company ledgers, they all sit and reside inside that company, which means they have one point of attack. They can be hacked. JP Morgan was, was hacked by you know, the cyber thieves not so long ago. Home Depot, Target, we've had all these companies get hacked, precisely because there's one central repository of information. The Bitcoin ledger resides on you know, thousands of computers. You, you can't hack that. And when you think about it, that sounds great. And because of the complicated process the network uses to verify records, it is very secure. Now relax, I'm not gonna get into what that process is or how it works, but I will share a really helpful, really dumb metaphor for why it is safe. The way I like to think of it is that a, a blockchain is a highly processed thing, sort of like a chicken McNugget. And if you wanted to hack it, it'd be like, turning a chicken McNugget back into a chicken. And someday something will be like that. So very basically, that is the blockchain. A database that is nearly impossible to hack or tamper with, and which could possibly improve security, efficiency, and trust. That is why big companies like Walmart, IBM, and JP Morgan have all been experimenting with blockchain as a way to potentially share and secure data uh, tran and, trans and transactions in a reliable, easy to access way. So, the basics. A blockchain is a database that's shared across a network of computers. It's some really nice graphics I got here. Uh, it's called a decentralized database or a distributed ledger. Once a record's been added to the chain, it's very difficult to change. The network is constantly checking to make sure that all the copies of the database are the same. Here is the basic makeup. So, a bunch of records form a block, and a bunch of blocks form a chain, which looks like a roll of paper towels in this case. The chain is held together by something called hash codes, which is just fancy math magic for something that prevents the contents of the chain from changing. If even one little bit of data somewhere in a block changes, the hash code changes and no longer matches the rest of the chain, and the chain falls apart at that block. That's why it's so secure. It's incredibly difficult to make a change after records have been written, unlike a regular database where you could just go in, change a record, nobody would ever know. So to add something to a blockchain, a transaction occurs and gets coded into a record. Say someone's selling a couple coins for $100. The record lists the details and a digital signature from each person. The record is then checked by the whole network. The computers in the network are called nodes, and they check to make sure the signature and details of the trade are valid. The records that are accepted are all added to a block, and each block contains a unique hash code, as well as the previous, ha previous hash code of the chain. So if the hash codes match up correctly, the block is added to the chain. And if anyone tries to tamper with the block or the records, it breaks the hash and the block is thrown out before it can be added. I hope that's like semi-clear. I had to watch that several times before I really wrap my head around all this. So blockchain tech has obviously been useful as the basis of Bitcoin itself, but a lot of other possible uses are emerging as well, and this is one of the more exciting parts. One of the fundamental benefits is that blockchains solve the problem of trust, which is a really important problem to solve. In ordinary transactions, you have to trust the person you're dealing with, or trust in a third party, such as a bank, to compensate you if that person turns out to not be trustworthy. The blockchain ensures you can transact with people even if you don't trust them. It removes the need for third parties, such as Visa or PayPal or whoever, uh, to process and guarantee your transactions. So this is actually pretty big. It completely changes the basis of our monetary system. We have no need for third parties. Every transaction can be cheaper, faster, and more secure. This is why people call Bitcoin a monetary revolution.
is also why the traditional institutions don't necessarily love it so much. It kind of directly attacks some of their business model and revenue model and takes away uh, the power from the big institutions and gives it back to the individual. In banking, financial institutions have been investing in blockchains to simplify their record keeping for payments. As a supply chain enhancement, record recording trades on a blockchain offers a way to check the history of the product. Jewelry companies hope it can assure customers that diamonds are not from places that could fund war or violence. In healthcare, medical history could be securely stored and controlled by patients. I think the medical industry is actually a, a pretty perfect use case for blockchain, allowing patients to secure and control their own medical history. One of our advisors at Hooch actually just launched a blockchain healthcare company that pays you for keeping your medical history up to date, which is pretty cool. They consider healthcare data to be your private property, and if anyone is making money from that data, it should be you. For voting, blockchain records could create tamper-proof election returns. Storing land records on a blockchain could cut down on title research and insurance. In politically unstable places, it could help prove ownership. Identity is a big use case for blockchain. Centralized databases are central points of failure for your identity just like what happened with Equifax with their recent hack. Private data on 140 million people got stolen. Some engineer at Equifax forgot to install security updates on their system, so almost half of the population in the US gets their data stolen. There's a huge problem with these centralized systems, and it's going to keep happening. But blockchain offers a plausible, secure solution to this. In advertising, the IAB released a statement saying, Given the complex nature of the digital advertising supply chain, blockchain technology can offer greater efficiency, reliable, and high quality data. In fact, IAB already put out their own white paper detailing how today's problems in ad tech can and are being solved by blockchain. So, everything sounds great, right? Take a look at these hyped up headlines. <laughs> yeah. So blockchain is suddenly the solution to disease and poverty and human trafficking, or even somehow helping you lose weight. There's actually a company out there doing that. But it's important not to get caught up in all the hype. Like It's not some magic solution to everything. It's got plenty of problems that still need to be solved. A lot of not so reputable companies have announced that they're throwing some part of their business on the blockchain to raise a ton of money. And that works. But it takes away attention from the real projects in the space, and it's definitely getting a lot of attention from the SEC, clearly. The Long Island Ice Tea Company infamously tripled the value of their stock by changing their name to Long Blockchain. <laughs> so that's where we're at. A lot of times the question might be, why does this particular project need to be on the blockchain, and can't you do whatever you're doing without it? And the answer is usually, yeah, you don't necessarily need the blockchain. It can be done with a good old-fashioned database, and there's not necessarily a need to involve blockchain tech. But there's a few problems that blockchain solves specifically really well, uh, but plenty of things that it's just not that good at yet, like high-speed transactions and scalability. It's really pretty terrible at that. So, <laughs> yeah, that's cute, right? <laughs> A Bitcoin transaction could take 10 minutes or longer to clear. Compare that with credit card companies which are capable of processing 30,000 or more transactions per second. You can see that we're nowhere near being able to use blockchain or Bitcoin for microtransactions. There have been improvements in Bitcoin speeds uh, with some very clever solutions put out by the community, like something called the Lightning Network. Uh, but more and more people are solving blockchain limitations with brand new chain technology. Bitcoin and monetary transactions were the first big use case of blockchain. So Bitcoin is often, often called a first generation crypto. Second generation cryptos, such as Ethereum, took this concept and innovated much further. Ethereum transactions process in about 14 seconds compared to Bitcoin's 10 minutes. Bitcoin uses a blockchain to record financial transactions where second generation cryptos use a blockchain to ex execute something called smart contracts. They're smart because they execute automatically with no need of a third party to verify them. This is a really significant development that has big potential for companies. Consider that 
all businesses are founded on contracts. For example, your company provides some goods or services. Your customers pay you for those goods or services at a price you both agreed on. When you deliver in a time frame into a standard that you also agree on, then you get paid. That's the fundamental understanding of most businesses. And just like financial transactions, it requires trust. If you've ever invoiced somebody and had a late payment, and given the nature of the digital marketing world, I'm sure a lot of us have, you'll know it's widely open to abuse. You're trusting that the other party sticks to the terms you both laid out, and if you don't, then you need to get a third party involved, like a lawyer or FTC or whoever. So smart contracts automate the whole process. They can be customized endlessly to fit different situations. But in the most basic example, think of it like a vending machine. Say you want to buy 10,000 cans of Coke from Coca-Cola. You both agree you'll pay 20 cents a can and you'll receive them in five days. Now to make sure Coke delivers on time, you write into your purchase agreement that for every day they're late, you'll pay 1% less. Both you and Coca-Cola agree to this condition, but you use an Ethereum smart contract to submit your order and you wait. So Coke delivers five days late. The contract automatically executes when the delivery is confirmed on the Ethereum blockchain, Coca-Cola is automatically uh, sent. Coca-Cola Coca automatically sends $1,900 from their bank account to you, reflecting the 1% daily discount for late delivery. You don't have to do anything; it happens on its own. That's a simple example, but in reality, smart contracts are extremely powerful tools. The hot new term is DAP, which stands for Decentralized App, referring to an interactive application powered by smart contracts. This is where things get really interesting. You can start to create complex, automated systems run entirely on the Ethereum network. You're not hosting your backend logic, logic on Amazon Web Services or anything like that. Ethereum itself is your backend doing all your logic for you thanks to decentralized processing. You can set smart contracts to trigger automatically when a certain exp expiration date or strike price is hit. And because it's on a public ledger, the contract can't be gamed or changed. More than that, they never go offline. As long as Ethereum exists, your smart contracts aren't going anywhere. And there's transparency. Everyone involved in the contract has the ability to scrutinize the transaction. In a digital marketing company, consider a smart contract that gets updated every day with the latest delivery, impressions, or click data, and then automatically initiates payment when the campaign concludes. You always get paid on time and never underpaid. For a bigger example, consider using smart contracts to buy a house. Usually this process requires third parties such as a lawyer and a broker. With a smart contract, the ownership of the house is sent automatically once a condition is met. The contract in this case is looking for $100,000. Once you send payment, the contract verifies it and the ownership of the house is automatically transferred. No need for the middlemen since that system itself provides the trust for you. So developers have really run with this tech and have used Ethereum as a backbone to create a ton of specialized tokens based on blockchain and smart contracts, all with the intent of solving very specific problems. There are cryptos that are used for paying advertisers, trading electricity like power ledger, storing files, transferring currency, sending messages, loaning money, registering land, creating insurance policies, everything. And it's becoming a much more crowded industry already. But because it's so easy for anyone to generate their own Ethereum-based token now, the number of diff different tokens out there has exploded. Some good and a lot of not so good. So now, at this point, you know basically what Bitcoin is. It's the future, bro. And why people are excited about blockchain. It won't let people chicken up your nucks. But... <laughs> You might still be wondering, well, what about all the other cryptocurrencies that I've heard about? Okay, well, the key software to create a coin is open source, meaning that just about anyone can create one. So they have done that. There are now over 1,500 cryptocurrencies that you can buy with names like Titcoin, Trumpcoin, Jesuscoin, Insanecoin, Electronium, Wax, Particle, Deep Onion, Snovio, Pluton, Nubits, and Clams. A list so insane that you can't tell which ones are real and which are made up because they're all real. I didn't make any up. I tried to come up with a dumber name than Deep Onion and it just can't be done. And look, not all of these 
coins are like Bitcoin, just hoping to be the next currency. Oftentimes, startup companies will sell a coin to try and raise money as an alternative to issuing stock. And sometimes, those coins are meant as tokens to be used for services that the startup might eventually provide. Kind of like the tokens at Chuck E. Cheese, only virtual and not redeemable at a rat-based food import. <laughs> So, hopefully I did an okay sort of job of uh, understanding or explaining very quickly blockchain, Ethereum, and all that, uh, and understanding how Ethereum improved on Bitcoin's pure blockchain technology by adding in smart contracts, which are super important to this. Uh, if you're not feeling overwhelmed yet, there's a lot more. Go ahead. <laughs> There's already new cryptos that are essentially looking to be the next generation of Ethereum. So, you gotta keep up. EOS, Cardano, and others are promising much better scalability and security. These are already multi-billion dollar market cap on all these other tokens. And now we have what you could call third generation cryptos, which promise vastly improved performance because they completely throw away blockchain technology. They're not using it at all. Instead, they're going in a completely new cutting edge technology direction, making use of a concept called directed acyclic graphs. A mathematical model promising all the benefits of blockchain with none of the scalability issues. Now let's take a look at how directed acyclic graphs work. I'm just kidding, I have no idea how to do this. <laughs> it looks super complicated though, but maybe we give that a few years. So, let's talk more specifically about blockchain in the advertising world. I think the timing on this topic was actually pretty lucky. In the last month and even the last few days, uh, there's suddenly a whole lot of news coming out about the specific use case of blockchain. IAB is release, releasing statements on how it could help track video ads. Adweek is speculating on the future of the industry. A Forbes article from two days ago talks about how the technology could render YouTube ads irrelevant. And last week, the Wall Street Journal explored solving major brand advertising problems with blockchain. The general news is that the secure, transparent nature of the technology has drawn interest in the advertising world, where dealings between marketers, their ad agencies, and tech vendors often aren't that transparent, leading to distrust and fears among advertisers that they're wasting money. The head of global marketing for Anheuser-Busch was just quoted as saying, in the next two to three years, most of the programmatic media will move to being blockchain-based because advertisers will want, will want transparency and this will provide it. The objective here is not about savings, it's more about transparency to make sure we're reaching consumers in the most relevant way. So what problems is the industry facing that blockchain can help with? Last year, out of every dollar spent worldwide on programmatic ads, just 40 cents on average made it to the publisher selling the ad space. Centralized ad networks like Facebook are keeping the majority of what the advertiser actually spends. Brands are paying a sort of ad tech tax to the long chain of vendors between a marketer and the website running an ad. Manually, manually auditing campaigns is usually slow and difficult, and oftentimes revenue is being siphoned off by the middleman. Bots and fraud are everywhere, making it difficult to tell if your ads are being viewed by real people. It's estimated that $8 billion a year is lost to ad fraud, which is crazy. Advertisers find it difficult to get reliable data. Engagement level with ads is low, and consumers are being tracked constantly. Even though it's their personal data, consumers have lost control over it and see no benefit from a third party selling their data to someone else. All these trackers, scripts, and unwanted ads have driven up the use of ad blockers. Up to half of the content on some websites is purely ads and trackers. If you're using an ad blocker, you typically have a much faster browsing experience, which is bad news for publishers and advertisers. So, blockchain to the rescue. For publishers, all impressions can run through a smart contract with an insertion order attached. That's digitally signed each step of the way. Currently, many publishers are paid on a net 60 or net 90. Through blockchain, this, issues can be, this issue can be solved by allowing advertisers and publishers to transact instantly based on individual impressions rather than month-end results. This means daily payments for publishers. 
for trustworthy ad tech companies that deliver value within the supply chain. Blockchain represents a boon through which firms can transact easily, demonstrate their value, and continue to serve as an integral part of a complex transaction chain. It enables trustworthy companies to capture the ad revenue from others, which might engage in fraud. With ad campaigns, blockchain offers a faster, more reliable way to track advertiser spending and reconcile discrepancies with suppliers. The technology can help track whether ads are running on websites with real traffic and on portions of the site that are actually visible to ordinary users. Campaign information can be included on stored blocks along with pricing information. Consumers can take control over their own data and viewing habits, even being rewarded directly for sharing their data or taking certain actions. IAB's new white paper points out the built-in ability to provide a layer of trust and transparency that isn't always available within media and advertising processes. It can be beneficial in situations where the publisher and advertiser might not have access to all the information on where ads are being served or even originally who paid for the ads. IAB specifically sees it as being useful for video ad inventory, fraud prevention, whitelisting authorized sellers, campaign reconciliation, and simplifying the I.O. process. Anheuser-Busch is testing a solution that records ad campaign data to the blockchain. Nestle is beginning to test a product that lets all advertising vendors get paid at the same time directly by the buyer. The head of e-business at Nestle, who has a name that I have no idea how to pronounce, says he sees the time coming where they put a requirement in ad contracts, stipulating that partners must use a blockchain tech, uh, solution to do business with Nestle. Kellogg and Bayer are starting to use blockchain to gain some transparency into their ad spend and eliminate fraud. While well, IBM announced just last month uh, at uh, Camp Lion in France <coughs> that they're partnering with MediaOcean to launch a blockchain pilot with big brands like Unilever and Pfizer. Kochaba just announced an open source blockchain framework for insertion orders built out of smart contracts. The IO specifics, delivery, and performance specs are available immediately to all parties throughout the blockchain's distributed ledger. Since it's done with smart contracts, the IO will fulfill the terms of its own agreement by triggering payment when the ads are delivered in play. Now this is a cool project that uh, famously raised $35 million in 30 seconds. It's created by the guy who used to be the CEO of Mozilla. The project is a new web browser called Brave that pays out users with something called basic attention tokens. It's a reward for viewing ads in the browser. Kind of reminds me of Net Zero, if anyone's holding that for that. So it blocks a lot of unwanted ads by default, so there's more attention left for high quality ads. In turn, the browser knows which publisher sites you're spending your time on, like Reddit, ESPN, or whatever, and automatically transfers some of those tokens you're earning back to the publishers as a proportion of how much time you're spending on that particular site. Users see less ads and have a better browsing experience overall, and publishers get better ad revenue than they're, they'd be getting from low quality ads anyway. So, last example, and this is our project. Uh, my company Hooch launched a product called Tap. Uh, on the surface, it's essentially credit card rewards on the blockchain. So right now, your credit card data is getting sold 15 different times to different companies, and you're not seeing any value at all from that. All the money goes to the big centralized credit card companies selling your data. TAP removes any personally identifiable information and encrypts your credit card transaction history on the blockchain. By decentralizing it like this, it opens the door for you to be able to monetize your own purchase data, which is really quite valuable. Right now, credit card companies reward you usually 1% cash back in the form of points. But by removing the need for middlemen and relationships between brands and consumers, TAP can give you a consistent 5 to 10% cash back on your credit card purchases from any of our participating brand partners. One of the selling points is that this doesn't require some advanced knowledge of blockchain and technology in order to use. This is an entry point for the everyday consumer take advantage of blockchain tech without even needing to know that you're using it. You grant access to your credit card data, and that's it. You've got 100,000 bars and restaurants and hotels already in the network, and if you're spending with them, then you're automatically getting rewarded. If you spend $500 at a Marriott for a long weekend, you 
get $50 back in your wallet, which you can then spend towards your next hotel stay or drinks or food at any of our restaurant partners. Consumers are happy because they're getting paid, and brands are happy because it encourages you to be a loyal customer and spend more money with them. One of the interesting byproducts of this is what it means for brand advertising. So we already know all the supply chain issues with money getting siphoned off by middlemen and low engagement with people actually clicking on an ad. As an alternative to low engagement campaigns for major consumer brands, using a tap-based smart contract means tapping into consumer data and insights more efficiently within the blockchain framework. Brands will be able to create and manage millions of individual micro campaigns to engage consumers on a one-to-one -one basis, rewarding them for sharing their data and taking a desired brand action. Then they're able to track verified transaction history to build long-term relationships. Brands can access demographic and geographic data at the credit card level, and purchase data is arguably far more accurate in helping brands make more informed advertising decisions. For example, if a major pizza restaurant chain can find and advertise to consumers who have made purchases at their competitor pizza chain recently, it's far better targeting criteria than showing an ad on Facebook to everyone that's in a segment that you think likes pizza. In addition, brands can directly reward individual consumers via the TAP decentralized advertising platform and directly place TAP into a consumer's wallet. They do this to incentivize a user to perform a, desi a desired brand action, such as purchasing a product, taking a survey, or making a social media post. We've got a handful of major brands piloting this with us so far, and we're officially announcing at Advertising Week in New York uh, in a few months, so all very exciting and good times. And in conclusion, watching. <laughs> Also, if any of you folks want to try out Pooch, you can use that promo code, you get a free membership, 30 free drinks. But we're not here so much, right? I think New York's so close as well, so. That is all. Anything too difficult, please. <laughs> There's a lot of very smart people and, and huge funds betting one way or another that this is all going to be the future or this is all going to crash. And people are very passionate about it one way or another. So it's hard to sell help. I said no difficult questions. It depends on the chain. So a lot of the currencies have a uh, sort of built-in transactional model where they take a fraction of, like every time money's, or the crypto is changing hands, there's uh, the whatever authority gets like a piece of that money back. Uh, something like Bitcoin, I mean, there, there is no centralized company making money off of it. Uh, the, it basically empowers itself by uh, by taking a piece of each transaction and then putting that back into the network. Um, a lot of these newer currencies are sort of this hybrid centralized, decentralized model. Uh, a lot of the specific 
the tokens that solve a specific use case uh, have like really, really complicated tokenomics. Uh, like we had to hire somebody at Cooch who's much, much smarter than any of us that his literal job is only to figure out the tokenomics for us. So you have to make sure that you have this artificial economy, which is a complicated organism, and you have to be sure that your math is right, that your system will continue to fund itself and you're not gonna end up like paying the bill at the end of the day. It really, another difficult question. <laughs> Come on guys, anyone wanna know about free drinks? <laughs> Yeah, so how, how would you integrate like a crypto to take payment on the commerce side or whatever, right? Uh, so there's there's a lot of companies out there that already kind of solve this. Uh, there's literal a whole bunch of companies that do financial processing for cryptocurrencies, especially things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, so it, it literally is like a plug-in widget that you can like connect to your own API and your website or whatever, and it'll do the, the value conversion in real time for you. So you have the option of taking Ethereum if you choose to trade it, or if you choose to take it, uh, and it'll just do the math and then process to do your own wallet for you. So you don't necessarily have to take on the burden of developing that yourself anymore, which you did years ago, but now, now there's all these companies that are solving that. There's even a company called, uh, And I, I know there's, uh, I might want to check out BitPay. Um, they handle a lot of kind of like real world money processing. BitPay actually has like a, a debit card. You can load your Bitcoin or whatever onto a physical card and then use that to, to spend at real world places. Yeah, uh, in, in the advertising world, like everybody is, is starting to get into it like right now. Like I was, I was doing my research for this and I was kind of last minute like working on it last night and still articles are coming out like yesterday and the same day like uh, these companies are just, just now announcing that they're starting to do it because it solves the problem of transparency and because it solves the problem of speed and getting rid of the middleman in a lot of cases. Uh, if you have these smart contracts, which will just process IOs or, or get you paid, like it, it, you completely take out all the inefficiency and you can just do things automatically and not have to worry about uh, things going wrong or, or not getting paid or anything like that. doing, it's really kind of difficult to do individual like SMBs, like uh, individually owned bars and restaurants, so we started to do more uh, big chain conversations, like we're talking to Applebee's and Fridays and those kinds of places, which is just the operational intensity of managing hundreds and hundreds of SMB partners and, and keeping bartenders trained is kind of a nightmare, so. Uh, Hopefully we'll have more restaurant chains on board this year and to be able to announce something soon here. Yep. All right, let's give it up for Jared.